if I'm having strong feelings of caring how my social media looks, should I fast it? But I also know that God wants us to serve more than ever now. Um, and so really what God wants, where he wants your heart to be is that like when it comes to social media and your social media, that you would have this passion for people to encounter Jesus on your page. And that would be purely it. But that includes excellence too, um, that you would have a heart to represent Jesus rightly with excellence and just do anything in your power with the gifts God's giving you to show Jesus to the world, you know, um, which that, you know, a big reason why excellence is excellence is important is because that's how people take things like more seriously sometimes or maybe some people that wouldn't normally watch something, they watch it. Like, for example, if there's really bad audio or really bad video and, like, a video pops up on someone's page, it's going to be, like, most a lot of a lot more people would just scroll past purely because of the quality. Um, whereas if the quality was good a lot more people would might would end up just like watching, oh, what is this? Let me just watch this. That's just one example. And that's just, that translates to everything, everything. Like I, at, at church, at 5F Church, excellence is so important. Like the worship, how the worship sounds, how things look, how the live streaming is going, what the cameras are doing and capturing and everything. Like even me, I look overseeing it, I'm just really paying attention to de details of excellence because I know this is how more people will be reached. I know this great importance of excellence that if you don't have excellence, it can reach some people. The gospel can reach some people. The, the video, the message can reach some people. But with excellence, it will for sure reach more people. And not just that, but people will take one more seriously, like the message they have to say or the video that pops up. They will, um, they will see it as more like valuable where we have this message of like, like come to Jesus. This is who Jesus is. Come, come believe in him, receive from him. That's our message. Right. And so we want people to take us seriously so that they actually listen to us so that they, um, you know, are more, are more prone to put an ear closer come check out. You know what I mean? That's why excellence is so important because it translates to more, more people being saved because it translates to more eyes actually coming and looking and giving Jesus a chance. Amen. All of that to say, so like this question was, you're caring really about your social, how your social media looks. So that's not a bad thing if it's purely for the sake of Jesus. But if it's in a different way, that's more of like in a selfish way, that's more of like a stylistic way, like, ooh, I want it to look so pretty just for your own self. But if you're like, oh, I want it to look good for Jesus, I want it to look good so people maybe make it, take it more seriously, then that's good, you know? So just it depends on your heart. Just pay attention to your heart. Um, if... If you're finding you're like being obsessed with how it's looking, for example, just in a selfish way, then it would be important to fast it. But I shared this actually recently, but I want to share it again. I hear a lot of people saying this like, oh, I miss the lives. I miss the, the teachings. I miss the services because I, I'm fasting social media. That's not wise. What you should do is if you need to fast social media, find a way that you can still be connected to the word of God that you need. It's your bread. It's you you need this food, this nourishment. So um, find a way. Use your brain. Like, for example, here's an here's an example of what you could do. You could you could create a whole different social media account. All you need is an email, I think, uh, or a phone number. And you literally only follow one person, like you follow the church or you follow, you know, if you're following, if you're a um, planet at Fivefold Church, for example, you follow my account, you follow 5F Church and that's it, you know? So, and, and you only go on that account. You don't ever go on your other account where you're following all these other people and where you have your profile and everything. Um, that would be the wise way to go about fasting social media. Amen. Yeah. It's like, 
the way you get the word of God today and the anointing, the ma- I mean, for everyone, it's through the screen is one of the big ways, even if you're living in LA, like the lives, two lives a week, and even like the replay of Flourish, it's all online. So you don't want, you want to make sure you're not fasting the word of God, fasting the Bible, fasting the anointing. That's your daily bread. You need the anointing and the word of God daily. And it's going to be harming you to fast those things. <laughs> we need to be fasting the carnal things, not the spiritual things. Tips on pacing yourself with the work of God and serving amidst all the other things he has called you to do in your own personal life. So especially in this supersonic speed of revival that God is taking us, he's really calling us all to sacrifice more than ever. I mean, even in my own personal life, even though I, I'm constantly you know, sacrificing to do the work of God, but when Flourish happened, revival wrecked my daily schedule. You know, like my, my day today has looked completely different, having to create space for even more work of God. A lot of it's having to do with... Um, really valuing what God did at Flourish and and like like letting the fruits be shown to te- to prophesy to others to open others eyes so that they can come and receive so like me personally I have this responsibility like I'm watching like every testimony it'll, I know it'll come to a point where I can't do that and that's okay and I have a team that's helping you know but right now I've been really watching like every testimony um, just to make sure that I'm completely valuing what God did and like showing like, look at what Jesus did. He did this and he did this and he did this because the more we do that, the more we testify, the more we show the fruit of Jesus, the more we show how amazing he is and what he's doing, the more attention Jesus gets from others. You know, the more people will hear, will see, they can't deny, the more their faith will be lifted you know, the more expectation that will come. So it's so important. So like my daily life the past like two weeks has been really shifted because of this, the shift that God took us on. It required more surrender. It required more sacrifice. And um, for me, it required like less like downtime. And that's okay. That's, I remember in 2021, there was this shift and it was way, because rest and downtime is really important um, regularly, usually. But then there will be certain times where at the speed that God's going, there has to be a sacrifice in that area and there's a grace for it. Like, um, you you know, you're not going to get burnt out because where normally maybe you would because of the grace that's on this. It's like God is calling you to go really fast here. um, And because he's calling you to go fast, because he's calling you to sacrifice more, there's a grace where you're able to go faster. It's like he's literally pushing you faster, but you have to agree to go faster with him, you know? I remember when the revival first broke out, I was, um, well, like all of the, so it was just shocking the miracles that God was doing. It was like, I've never seen, I've never seen mass deliverance like this. I know so much of the world hadn't seen it before. It's when we were in the park and, um, you know, like we didn't have live streaming like we do now where we have camera crews. I mean, we were in the park, there's no Wi-Fi, you know? No, like there's like there was like we were able to get it like a couple outlets like outside. But, you know, it was all phone recording. So um, it's phone recording is not good, like live, like it comes out like not good quality. You can't hear very well. You can't get like close up. It's not clear. And as I said, excellence is also important to God. So um, we would film with cameras and then um, I would I would like. I remember like the next day that was on a Sunday and then on Monday I would be editing and editing takes a really long time when you're layer like layering and like two, two, three different camera angles or more and matching the audio up and like it just takes a long time. So I would literally just not stop until it was done. And so I, there were several Mondays after Sunday where I literally just stayed up the entire night and I, I, I was up till 10 a.m editing and then I would go to sleep for like six hours or so um because I, I I knew it was important to still like get sleep just even if it was looking differently like sleepy during the day and then like I would go live with it or I sometimes I would I, I had planned to go live or I would go live with the um what I just edited once I like woke up like late afternoon or evening 
And so like that wrecked my schedule. It wrecked my life, but in the best way, revival. (laughs) But I had so much joy more than ever before, like doing the work of God just filled me with so much joy. It, It became so much fun. Even I wasn't like feeling like this is so crazy and annoying, the sacrifice I'm making being up till 10 in the morning. No, like I was so overjoyed. Like these were the promises of God being fulfilled and it was just so exciting. I knew the fruit that would come from it for for more people to see what God was doing. And it's true. It, it made it. I know like one of those videos that I was staying up at probably till 10 a.m. doing, I think um, I think it was actually the first day that 300 people came and it was mass deliverance everywhere. Revival broke out. I think that YouTube video is titled um, Revival Broke Out, One Hour of Continuous Miracles. I think that's what I titled it on YouTube. And it has like, I forget the amount of views, but it has several hundred thousand views. And that's like, that's rare on YouTube, especially for an hour video. Usually it's just one minute videos that get 1 million views or some, or several hundred thousand views. But like, like, God, man, it's, it's exciting. Like in revival to, to step in line with God's supersonic speed. Um, because it's like with the more that you're doing in the revival, the more that God does, like he blesses the work of your hands. So I was up till 10 in the morning, you know, editing that, but it was more than worth it. Like several hundred thousands of people have seen it now, been blessed by it. And it led to so many more people coming. (laughs) So, um, yeah, like last week I was, um, watching every testimony video and, um, and then like Saturday, God gave me this idea to just, make this video like I had gone live earlier that week you know like an hour more than an hour but God was like I I felt Holy Spirit nudge uh leading me to make like a shorter video to just kind of like let the world know what God did like in a shorter version because a lot of people aren't going to watch an hour version so and to do it before the week was over you know um to really value what he had done and so I I did that and then as I started to just I put it on my editing program and then I got that idea to like show what I was talking about, to add like a video of what I was talking about, of like people being delivered, people receiving impartation. And then that led to another idea that led to another idea to add testimonies into, I had seen all these amazing testimonies. So it led me to that idea of, let me screenshot a little bit of this and a little bit of this. And, and several hours later before I had Sunday service to minister at, I mean, it was like 2 a.m. before I went to bed. And I have, I also was preparing for the message and everything and got less sleep than usually I would, but I was so full of energy. I was so full of energy Sunday, um, even though it was less sleep than I would normally like to get, you know, because there was so much grace on it. And so anyways, I just say all that to say, um, oh, anyways, I shared that, I got to share that that video on this past Sunday. And I was so grateful to God for just leading me because I know it was just really important and special for people to see like a glimpse of what God did, um, the story of what God did. And, um, so yeah, so I just give you a little glimpse into like how just even personally my life has shifted. And I just like, I just want that to translate for your life. Like this is what it looks like. It's, it's a different kind of life. It's a different, it's a, it's a more sacrifice, but it's, it's, it's like more exciting than ever to do the work of God and to make sacrifice because not only is it not in vain, but it's, it's leading to a faster increase, you know, like it's, God's like ready to move and he's ready to bless your hand, the work of your hands, like never before. He's ready to so many times we're sowing seeds and we don't see the fruit till a long time later, you know, but like right now it, it's a time of like qu- quickness of seeing the work of our hands, the, 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 the fruit, the harvest, even, even fast, even soon after, you know? So anyways, the question was like, how do we balance like doing more work of God and like with our own personal act- daily life? I would say it's so important to take care of your personal um, life, like get enough sleep, um, take care of yourself. You know, even this week, I didn't I didn't get to exercise the way I wanted, the way I like to like, but it's OK. Like it's just like certain sacrifice, like sleep and exercise. These are things that are important, 
but like in certain times it's we don't have to be religious about it and um you know you're not <laughs> your body's not going to start like deteriorating if you didn't get the five days of exercise but you got like two or three for one week for example you know what I mean like I you have to kind of make this shift once in a while as Holy Spirit's leading um so um and I mean part of that just has to do with even like there's just so much work to be done it's like we have to find time for more of this important work to be done for the kingdom so um, make sure you're not neglecting yourself make sure you're taking care of yourself like for me when I'm I, I still like I'm like okay but I, I want to make sure I can get like good sleep still I'm not gonna go overboard I'm not gonna be like I'm fine I have the Holy Spirit so I just will pull an all-nighter I won't get any sleep it's important that you don't go to that extreme as I shared I was up till 10 a.m but I still slept for five to six hours usually like at least six hours or so you know so that you can it's 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 um a marathon not a sprint but it's like we speed up the marathon in certain points. Like it's like a quicker move, but we a quicker run, a quicker pace, but we still have to realize it's a marathon. So generally just keep that in your mind, like certain move with the Holy Spirit. Like right now, God's asking everybody to sacrifice more in all areas for his work, contributing to his work so that because God's ready to go faster, so he needs all of us to do more so that that translates to speed, to speed that he wants to go. Um, but at the same time, don't disqualify yourself. Don't burn out that you can't even run the race and you can't do your part. One of my Spanish-speaking friends wants to know how to know when someone is free. Um, does something have to fall back, like when you are ministering? Um, well, it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. That's the most important thing. Um, especially like, you know, when you'll know them by their fruits. So if you're finding a ministry that there's just testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony um, of deliverance and like demons going quickly and like not a struggle, um, you know, you're just seeing that you're knowing that the anointing indeed is working. You're knowing that truly the power of God is there and demons don't win there, you know? And so what that is, is it's the Bible in action. It's like when Jesus cast out a demon, the demons didn't stand a chance. They had to go. His word would not return void. Um, when the disciples, the apostles in the Acts church were casting out demons, the demons had to go. There was not a struggle. Um, that's just how it was. We don't find it being this like huge struggle. I mean, the disciples were growing in the anointing at one time, but they hadn't been like commissioned by Jesus fully to um, go into the world yet. I mean, they were still being like trained by Jesus. So their anointing was not huge yet. It was growing in them. And there was one time in the Bible where they couldn't cast out a certain demon. The demon had a higher demonic power. But, but when it came time for them to be really launched into ministry, when they had grown, you don't find any examples in the Bible of the demons struggling. So what I'm speaking of is rare today, but it's it's real. It's out there. Revival is now. And so like a fivefold church, this is what we're seeing take place. And I, there's even you can even see it sometimes by the physical manifestations that the demons have to obey. You can see even physically sometimes um, by all of a sudden the person becomes still and comes to. Or they fall back and they become still. Like maybe they were screaming or weeping or shaking before. And then as soon as the command is issued, the, the weeping stops or the screaming stops or the physical manifestation stop, manifestation stop, or they become still. And then oftentimes there's such a wild joy like never before. And it's beautiful because you can literally see like someone has been in prison and they're feeling the height of the bondage in prison as – the demons are just trying so hard to keep them in prison right before they're delivered. Like as Jesus is walking with his keys to the door, like the demons are like constricting more on the person. Like, no, I don't want you to leave this prison as Jesus comes close. That's like when a person comes close to the anointing. And so the person many times they feel such discomfort like never before 
because the demons are afraid and trying hard to stop this, but they can't. They're just trying. And that's when you're feeling like sometimes people are like, ah, like I can't breathe. Like they're feeling the demons like latching on for dear life. They're sometimes they're, they look like they're in discomfort, you know, sometimes, or sometimes it looks can look like something even hurts sometimes it just right before they're being delivered. Cause the demons, they're about to leave and the demons are mad. It's not always, but just sometimes you see that. And then Jesus comes, the, he unlocks the key and the person who's been in bondage for many years or maybe their whole life, it's like they walk, there's like, it's like they're in a dungeon. Jesus opens the key. They see Jesus face to face, maybe even for the first time, look in his eyes. He grabs their hand and walks up the steps out of the dungeon, out of the dark, smelly, cold dungeon of, of demonic bondage and pulls them out into the fresh air and the sunshine for the first time. And it's like it's 70 degrees and smells beautiful and it's the sun beats on your face. Like imagine how you would feel if you were in literal prison like that. Maybe you never even experienced freedom before. You never experienced sunshine on your face and the breeze and the warmth and the the good smells, that, you know? And on top, so on top of that, Jesus is holding your hand and looking at you as you experience freedom. Like imagine how you would feel. That's like what it's like when someone's set free, when you're seeing that wild rejoicing that's like not normal, not natural, supernatural. When someone's like, jumping as high as physically possible and like, ah, like their face is smiling so big, like the biggest in their life. And they're, they're screaming for joy. That's what they're experiencing. That's what they're experiencing. So anyways, like there's, there's such evidence where we're like, like a fivefold church, there's such evidence. So you should know the anointing is real here. It's the Bible come alive here, just as it was in the time of Jesus where the demons have to go. Um, you should have that kind of faith by the fruits. By the fruits, you'll know them. So you see the fruits. So then, like, when a person comes, they should know, I'm going to get, if I, you know, if you have bondage, I'm going to get delivered here because this power of God is real because demons have to obey here, and that's it. And so if I command a demon to go, I'm not looking for physical manifestation. Sometimes there's no physical manifestation, but indeed the demon has left because the anointing's real. And the principles of God are real, like how demons cannot stay where the anointing is and where the true authority of Christ is being executed. The word of God cannot return void. So I'm never like concerned ministering like, I don't know if that demon left that person. Oh, I wonder. I didn't see a physical manifestation. So I really wonder. I hope the demon left that person. I'm never thinking that. Like I have faith in Jesus, his power and his principles. There's no like question. Um, so now we, the people ha do have a part to play. Like you have to believe and you have to grab the miracle. You have to, like the demon has gone and you have to believe it, whether you felt a physical manifestation or not. So you, and, and the physical manifestation of freedom will manifest. Like you'll see the fruit. You'll see, wow, I'm really free. Um, a day later sometimes, or two days later, or three days later, or a week later, or longer sometimes. Sometimes the anointing's working in you like medicine and you don't notice the difference immediately, but you will if you remain in faith, if you walk it out, if you walk your miracle out. Like, so you, you, you walk out that faith, like the word was spoken, whether it was one-on-one -on -one or whether it was to everybody, like a, a corporate prayer, like the word was declared and I have faith. You know, if, if, if Jesus was here physically and he spoke, everybody here, they all must be healed. They all must be free. Like you would believe, right? You, you would like Jesus said it like, but, but Jesus is here. We just don't see him physically. He's a spirit, but that's more real even than physical. His power is here. He is here. And so, and he uses vessels and he's given us the authority. And then he, he backs us up. He causes his, he, 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 he tell, he, he has his vessels, he tell, instructs his vessels to speak, to execute the authority. And then as they do that, he comes in power. And so you really need to have that kind of faith that it truly is Jesus here. It truly is Jesus speaking through the vessel. Like it truly is Jesus's power coming through the vessel and making the words to not return void. 
So it's so important that you have that faith and that you are not looking for anything physical or you're not wondering, did the demon go? It needs to be more simple in your heart. This is true anointing. This is this is what I read about in the Bible. The demons have to leave. So that when I go to that church, you know, when I attend that live stream, that word that's spoken, it must happen in my life. Just simple, period. Like it just must happen. I'm not, you don't look for a physical manifestation. You don't wonder, you don't test, is the demon gone? I don't know. You believe the demon had to have left or the miracle had to have happened. The healing had to have happened because your faith is such a big part of it. So you need to exercise your faith and partner with God in what he's already done in the spirit to see it stay and manifest completely. How do I know where God wants me to be planted when he led me to your ministry, but also to a local church where with anointed leaders in the city I live in and I receive from God through both churches? So you can only have one Elijah. Only one Elijah, only one. And we are called to be planted in one place. Now, there are going to be several anointed ministers out there. There's not as many right now because this is a new wine that God has brought. But as time goes on, there's going to be more and more and more and more true fivefold ministers that are anointed and really carrying the fruits. But when that time comes, God still wants you to be planted in one place. You know, you, you still have to be pl planted under your Elijah. Paul talks about Timothy. Paul wasn't the only fivefold minister at that time. Remember, he joined the other apostles. He joined the other mi fivefold ministers. And but but he speaks specifically about Timothy being his faithful spiritual son, who he loved dearly, who he trusted dearly, who was faithful. So and 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 therefore Timothy was like Elisha and Paul was like Elijah. And so if you're being buffet, even if it's just two places, you you are missing the principle. It, the principle God doesn't go against his principles of being planted in one place, which is where he is calling you to, like under your Elijah. God doesn't go against his principles. So you can still be receiving so much benefits. You can still be growing closer to Jesus. But when it comes to receiving the amount of anointing that God wants in your life um, and receiving the amount of wisdom that God wants in your life. Because God calls you to one place and there's a prophetic anointing moving specifically for those who are called there. Like it, it's supernatural. It's hard to understand or comprehend, but it's like, like I've heard so many testimonies of, you know, those of you that are planted, I've heard so many of your testimonies, like every single subscriber Q and A and every single live or every single Sunday, it was literally what you needed to hear exactly like, that week that day like it, it's hard to comprehend it's hard it doesn't make sense like how could this be true for like so many people but it is you know and so that principle works when you're planted in one place and that's what I mean where you really grow in wisdom you grow in clarity because you are getting it's like I don't know much about like fitness training and everything but this example just kind of came to my mind let's say you're like with a sp one trainer and they have you on this like plan um, to reach this goal or something. Um, and it's very detailed and you just do it every day and you see the goal reached because you just stayed committed to that one plan. There can be another great like fitness plan or whatever. But if you're like mixing both, it, it can kind of like bring confusion and it, it's like doing too much and it's, it's, the lack of focus, the lack of just being focused and, and being strict to the, the one can lead to not getting to that result that you want. I don't know much about fitness, but it's an example that came to mind. And that's what I mean. Like there's, there can be good, great teaching multiple places, but in terms of the most amount of growth and wisdom and clarity and also your assignment is important for you to be in one place. Also, um, Elisha received the mantle from Elijah. So Elijah had a specific calling from God, a specific assignment. And Elisha had like the same assignment and calling. Joshua had the same assignment and calling as Moses. Moses' assignment and calling was to lead the Israelites to the promised land. 
to be the voice of God and to be the vessel of God to perform miracles uh, and the voice, of God, the voice of God to provide direction for the people to get them all in one accord, united, and to be able to get into the promised land. They both had the same calling. Moses took them from A to B. Joshua took them from B to C. But it was that same line from bondage to the promised land. So Joshua received that same mantle for that same assignment. And he needed to grow in that wisdom and equipping. He need, like Moses had to have a certain kind of wisdom to lead the Israelites to the promised land. He had to have a certain kind of wisdom to lead them. He, he had to have that understanding, for example, that they have this slavery mindset and how to help them, help them overcome that. He had to have the understanding that um, they were lacking in faith lots of times. He had to have that understanding of like speaking firmly sometimes, like why stop worshiping false gods, you know, like. There was something specific, a specific wisdom that Moses carried, that God gave him a special grace to have that wisdom to be able to complete that assignment. So that wisdom was imparted to Joshua, Joshua walking with Moses and even getting to know what that calling was that Moses had seen firsthand. You know, he saw firsthand how the people were. He saw how Moses was led by God to lead the people, to correct the people, to equip the people. He was on the the battlegrounds with him, you know, like he was he was on the field with him for a long time. Um, and so all of that led to Joshua being able to really perform his calling, like really walk out his purpose in the fullness. You know, he had the he had the impartation of the anointing. And he had the equipping that Moses had. And that's how he was able to do his job. That's how he was able to complete this assignment. So people have different assignments in the body of Christ, you know, and like, like this assignment that, that God's given Fivefold Church, I know it's so unique. I know it's so unique. And I know there's a special revelation that God's released here. Um, so I know that it's important for, like you have this assignment too. So it's important for you to, be on the field like Joshua was with Moses and not leave and not miss something, not miss something that you need to see, you need to learn, you need to hear, and also not get other stuff mixed in that's keeping you from being built up. Like it's like um, you can only eat so much. You have a steak, you have a, you have a nice meal, a steak and a salad and mashed potatoes. And you have um, on this side, you have a chicken and you have um, cooked vegetables and you have um, sweet potato or something, right? They're both beautiful meals. They're both great meals. Can you fit both meals into your stomach though? So God needs you to have, let's say, the steak and the mashed potatoes and the salad. Like that's Joshua taking in everything from Moses. So he needs that. He needs those nutrients that's coming from that food. He needs the entire plate, not half of it. But if you're taking half of the plate that has the chicken and the sweet potatoes and the cooked vegetables, you eat half of that and you eat half of the steak. Now at face value, that's like, it seems even better. It's like the best of both worlds because personally, even me, like that, I just created like a yummy meal for, for myself, for my- <laughs> Like I like I really like sweet potatoes, but I also like mashed potatoes. And I really like I probably prefer steak over chicken, but I like them both. If it's like barbecue, got some barbecue on there, probably it's like almost equal, you know. <laughs> and I love cooked veggies the best if they're the best kind. But if it's a salad the way I like it, like some maybe some candied pecans and the right kind of salad dressing, and maybe some kind of cheese, like maybe goat cheese, maybe maybe blue cheese. I'm not a huge blue cheese, but sometimes it tastes good. Like that. <laughs> but like that, mmm. So it feels like, man, this is even better. But God needed you to have just the steak plate. And instead you got half the steak plate. So you as Joshua is half equipped. And then you're half equipped 
to do a different assignment that God didn't call you to. That, that's what it looks like in the spiritual realm. That also translates also to contributing to the work of God. Because wherever God calls you to be planted, he wants you to contribute. He wants to contribute with your hands, with um, serving him, um, with uh, 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 sowing. Um, and so if you're giving half of that, if Joshua is giving half of that to Moses, guess what Moses is lacking? Moses is not receiving the help he needs and that God called him to have help. Because remember, the Bible says Joshua was a servant of Moses, not Joshua was a servant of two people, two servants of God. So it's negatively impacting actually the work of God. God wants people all in and fully trained so that they're all at the full capacity, not half capacity to do the work of God. God wants that for this ministry here and God wants that for this ministry here and this ministry over here. He doesn't want like one amazing ministry and another ministry, amazing ministry over here and they're like they're half, they're half in here and they're half in here. So you got a bunch of half in people half equipped people ha ha for that specific assignment I'm saying that's what that's the real meaning and it's a spiritual thing that I'm speaking like it's a spiritual thing that happens a spiritual principle that happens your God calls you to one assignment one one purpose like in terms of his work you need to be a professional when it comes to the word of God, the prophetic word of the rhema word of God that God wants speaking, this new wine that God's speaking. You need to be a professional, not just like halfway having the knowledge and wisdom about it. And this is what makes the impartation of anointing come upon your life. When you follow these principles, it makes the anointing come upon your life more, not just halfway. It makes it come upon your life more. So seek God with where he wants you to be planted. And that's going to, how will you know where you're to be planted? Where you've seen the most fruits in your life and also where your heart is lit up more. Also where you feel in the spirit pulling you, like you feel this pull, you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you. You also have to hear the word of God, like what God is doing right now, this new thing that he's doing. You have to say, God is calling all of his people to be part of this revival, this end time revival. So, um, you know, if, if, if you can, at this time, it's going to look different. God's going to call some people to be when they live in a different city or a country. He'll call them to just be completely online and not attend a local church. Other times you might feel it's okay like to attend a local church, but you know where you're really planted. Like like if God's calling you to be planted at Fivefold Church, for example, and you don't live in the city of LA, but you know God's calling you to be planted there. So when you are going to another church, it's the purpose more of uh, 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 opening eyes many times, uh, sharing testimony because the anointing is rare. Many people are not receiving deliverance, healing, the power of God impartation. So maybe God can have you there for a season of a, a purpose of planting seeds, of sharing testimony of what God's doing. Um, but to, to know it's not like, okay, I'm receiving here and I'm receiving here. Know where you're really receiving. Like know where God has called you to really receive. Know if he's called you to eat the steak plate or the chicken plate. <laughs> Amen. Do you have a story to share about your experience with your spiritual father? How do you tune into his teachings? I was actually just thinking about him and I wanted to, wanted to share about even my own experience in this. The way that I've grown, the way I've grown to be mature and strong and like the, the way the word has grown in me, the way that I can receive revelation from God and the way I can speak the word that glory to God God opens up people's eyes and really equips them and builds them. And it's prophetic. And it's, you know, the way I've grown spiritually, carrying the, the meat, the, the mysteries, the secrets of the mysteries of the spiritual realm, the, the secrets of the anointing. It's by doing what I just taught you. It's by choosing the steak plate. <laughs> really. Really, 
I, I, I stayed focused. I didn't go listening here or there, reading this book, this book, this book. I stayed focused. What I needed, what I, like, I, I, I didn't need anything else. God needed me to stay focused, be planted, receive from my Elijah. My spiritual father, prophet Dr. Jordavi, is my Elijah. And he carries this wi great wisdom like I've never seen anywhere. And prophetic eye into the spiritual realm. I mean, I, I couldn't want for anything. It's like such a high level, high level wisdom. You know, um, but above all, like God was just calling me to receive from there. So for me, I, I'm a unique case. I'm a I'm a unique case. Like usually one would be planted at a church and they're receiving the teachings. But for me, like according to my calling, it was a very unique situation where it wasn't like God was calling me to learn Swahili language and like listen to all this the, the messages. But I have spoken to my spiritual father again and again. He preaches to me on the phone. I in English, he speaks really good English. He preaches to me on the phone. I've 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 talked to him consistently. I've heard the word of God from him consistently on almost a daily basis for years. Now it's been, it'll be eight years I've been his spiritual daughter this September. Constantly growing, constantly learning, constantly eating the steak plate, constantly eating that meal, that one meal and that's one of the big secrets of how i've grown in the anointing in the anointing to cast out demons to receive that mighty impartation and to teach with the anointed word and teach with authority and grow in revelation I, I do not preach like I preached a year ago. I do not preach like I preached two years ago. I do not preach like I preached seven years ago for sure. I think a lot of you would be uh, really shocked how I preached seven years ago, six years ago. Um, that's a secret. I don't teach random things. I don't teach you. I teach you my life. I teach you from experience. That's why I, I speak passionately. I speak firmly. I don't speak timidly. I, I, I speak new wine boldly with courage because I've lived it. I've tested it. I mean, not that I need to test it, but like I've tasted and seen this is true what I'm saying. It's up to you to take the word, to value the word. But I'm telling you, I've lived what I'm teaching. What I just taught you the past like 15 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever, about being planted, I have lived that 100, not 90%. I've lived that 100% for seven and a half, almost eight years now. So you be the judge. The Bible says, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. Like if you, if you like what you see in my life, if you want to see that kind of spiritual growth and wisdom and maturity and even... Uh, and the anointing, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. Amen. Like take the words I say seriously, even if it's such new wine, you've never heard it before. God's doing a new thing. Those who will receive the word, those who will receive this that I'm sharing, they're the ones that will grow. They're the ones who will become leaders. They're the ones who will be so powerfully anointed. People will wonder, why them? Why them? Why not me? Because they valued the word. They were good soil for the word to come up, come on, to fall on. So they were able to grow. They were able to receive. It takes humility. It takes surrender. How should we respond to a homosexual person who's offended by a video posted about being delivered of homosexuality? Or should we respond? The Bible says that the things of the spirit are foolish to the carnal man. And so on the topic of homosexuality, the fact that God has really created man and woman to be man and woman, 
in every aspect of that meaning of the word. Um, and to, you know, not have sexual desires and relations with the same sex. God hasn't created it to be that way. That, that, um, that's a thing of the spirit that's foolish to the carnal mind. Okay, so when you find someone finding something foolish of the spirit, you can really know they have a carnal mind. They at least have a carnal mind in that area. Maybe they're spiritual in other areas, but they have a carnal mind in that area. Their spiritual eyes, there's many different layers to your spiritual eyes. Many different layers, right? Like you can be really spiritual in one area. You can be really spiritual in the fact that you know, you believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. 100%, not 99%. You believe that you see that. One can see that. Well, they are very spiritual in that area. But in a million different other areas of the spiritual realm, of different things of the spirit, they could be completely blind. Or maybe they're halfway blind, halfway spiritual. So that's what we're, that's the world we're living in in the body of Christ. We're living in a world where it's rare to have spiritual maturity and spiritual eyesight. We're living in the world, like Paul says, I want to give you meat, so you should be able to teach others, but you're still needing milk. So we're having so many babies that, you know, babies can't comprehend and understand how adults can. We have so many spiritual babies who can't comprehend and understand the things of the spirit. They don't see. They just can't see the truth. That's the world we're living in. We got to accept that and don't feel bad about it and don't wonder, how can they not see? And we also can't force it. So just walk with wisdom knowing like you can't force someone's eyes to be open. The kindness of God leads to repentance. Um, just be kind to them. You don't have to force it to them. Um, eyes are opened with humility as when, 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 when the Disciples first came back from casting out demons. Jesus says, I praise you, Father, for hiding these things, the revelation of your authority. So it also could mean for hiding the things of the Spirit, the revelations of the Spirit. I praise you for, re for hiding the revelations of the spiritual realm to those who are proud and carnal and for only revealing it to those who are childlike and humble. So when one is childlike and humble, they will have a heart to understand. Maybe they're like, wait, I just really don't, I really, you know, Someone who's childlike and humble, they will see verses in the, in the scripture like how God created man and woman. And he said, um, multiply. That was the direction. Create man, create woman, multiply. So he's saying, sleep with one another. <laughs> create children. Like, that's a command. <laughs> you know, he didn't say, unless you feel that you want to sleep with the same sex, in that case, you won't be able to create. So I'm saying this for just those of you that have that, that sexual desire towards the opposite sex, like, you know, like God said that, okay, number one. And number two, there's verses that say that um, sleeping, having sexual relations with the same sex is a sin, you know? So if a Christian is humble and childlike, they will see those scriptures. And even if they don't understand it and they don't agree with it, they will at least be humble about it. They will at least be like, I don't understand this. Like, the Bible says this, but like, this doesn't make sense to me because these people are having these feelings since they were a young child. It's like they were born with it. So I don't understand, but maybe when they see a testimony video of someone being delivered of um, homosexuality, lifestyle, and uh, um, feelings and thoughts, um, maybe they're like, maybe they strike up a conversation with you. Like, I don't understand this. Like, they said this happened, but I see all these people in my life that they have these strong feelings since they were a kid. And then we have the scripture. I don't understand, you know, like, do you understand this? And that's a time where you can then, that's a time where someone's humble, childlike, and they're open. They're open for their eyes to be opened. And so that's a time where, you know, okay, God right now is using me to at least plant seeds for their eyes to be opened. That's a time where you can explain what you've learned. You can explain what you've learned, what you see in the spiritual realm, how you see 
there's such a demonic influence on people in so many different areas. And that includes in their thoughts, in their feelings, even in their sexual feelings, there can be a demonic influence there that even can come in at a young child that even can come in through um, when someone's abused by the same sex, maybe. And then afterwards, you know, maybe let's say some, they were touched in their sexual areas and they felt something because that's just natural for the body to like feel something if it touched there. And then, then the person immediately thinks, well, because I like felt something, then, or, you know, I guess that means I'm this, or even if they didn't feel something, the devil can speak immediately bring, he will immediately strategically bring thoughts like, um, of, of, of like, this happened to you because this is who you're supposed to be or immediately start giving sexual thoughts in that area because a person of the same sex did sexual things to them. The devil comes with that thought being like, yep, that's right. You know, this is what's right. And this is who you are. And devil, the devil brings these lies and people don't realize that it's the devil. And so they think that any kind of feeling or thought they have is the truth. So your eyes have been opened up to all these things, right? And so, you know, the root of it is the enemy and his lies and demonic oppression and the more we open up doors, the stronger it comes, the stronger the oppression comes. So someone can be 100% sure they are homosexual because they've kept opening up doors and it's those feelings and thoughts and sexual um, sexual feelings, sexual attractions have become even stronger, you know? So you can have that kind of conversation with somebody and also share testimonies with them. Like, listen, I've seen these testimonies at Five Hole Church. I've seen, I've heard testimonies from other people, you know, and then that can really open up a person's eyes or it can at least plant seeds, maybe if they're not ready to fully receive and have their eyes opened up, but that's the time to talk about it. But if they're not opened, just it's, they're not ready to receive it. So don't push it. And just instead treat them with love, treat them with kindness. And just, if it's a testimony of someone sharing, this is what happened to me and I'm happy and blessed, like, there's nothing to be offended about or wrong. I mean, it's, it's that person's testimony. So they're fully, so you're not doing anything wrong by sharing a testimony. You know, there's nothing for you to feel bad about. And that person really needs, really should, you know, respect a person's own testimony. So you don't need to feel bad about it. You don't need to feel like you offended someone. Just bless them, be kind to them. If it's someone close in your life, you may need to put up boundaries if they're, you know, going against your faith so much, like at your faith, in your face. Should Christian men be more selective about going on dates? Uh, yeah, well, God only wants you to be with someone who's equally yoked. And so um, you should get to know someone as a friend first. And even if you have romantic feelings or whatever feelings about the person, you should... Um, really try not to dwell on those and not go there yet, especially because we're, we are human and we are human. We are not like 100% spirit. And so we want to make sure that the feelings are pleasing to God. We want to, we would do We don't want to jump ahead of the wisdom of God and God's directions by leaning too much into our feelings. So try to not focus or dwell on those feelings and try to really get to know the person as a friend and um usually at least at first in in more of a group type of environment um especially so you can really stay focused more on the person as like as a friend not in a romantic way and you know when you have that surrendered heart god will open your eyes and show you like this would be an equally yoked person like this is a safe person this is you know this is a truly surrendered person with a pure, humble heart. And so once that's revealed and once um, time has passed, things aren't rushed because of feelings, intense feelings, um, then it could be a time with the Holy Spirit's leading uh, to take a person, take, take her on a date, for example, um, or ask you know, um, but it, it depends like how also how close you are 
I mean, how serious you are serving in the work of God, you should also be open with your spiritual parent. If you're like serving really close to the anointing, it's like you have to take everything even more seriously. Like, I want to make sure I'm not going by my feelings. You know, you want to just be open. You know, you don't want to hide things. You just want to be open to really do everything you can to make sure you're being in God's will and really being led by the Holy Spirit. And a lot of that can have to do also with the timing of God. Like if if God wants you to be just, you know, how we're going supersonic speed in this revival, for example, like there can be certain season where the timing's not right yet simply because of what God is calling you to do, to do in his kingdom and his work. And that's why I said it's important to be really sensitive to the Holy Spirit and really make sure you're really being led by him to make sure the timing's right when it comes to these things. What type of boundaries we should have should we have with family members that are not believers in regards of spending time with them like friends or blood sisters and brothers that you love? So it's very important to see yourself very important in the kingdom like I have this assignment it is very serious and I have to protect this anointing and I have to keep this fire and I have to stay focused and I have to like manage my time perfectly like if God's called me to do this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this, I have to make sure I have time to do all of that. So you make that priority. You make keeping your fire, protecting the anointing, and doing the work of God, um, and, and and receiving the word of God, like, so you can keep growing. You make all of that priority. That's number one. And then everything else will fall into place. If you can keep that, like, to know, like, you are not... You are not obliged to um, spend a certain amount of time with, like, family members. It's what God is speaking over your life. That's the only thing that matters. You need to really keep that in your heart because people, and in, in, they have their culture, they have their traditions, and then they have their feelings. And you can't let that get in the way of what God's asking you to do. And you can't, like, feel guilty about what God is calling you to do. You know what I mean? I mean, um, like... Like, I, um, I, I love my family. I, all of my family is in upstate New York. Um, my grandma is there. She's in her late eighties. My, I have, I have an aunt and uncle that are there and cousins. And, um, I have a couple other more distant, like not as like, uh, close, close, like the first degree close family that's like in other States like Virginia and Ohio, but when it comes to like, um, like my sister, my brother, my brother-in-law, my niece and nephews, they're in upstate New York as well. And, um, before, before, um, God called me to this calling, I came out to Los Angeles and I came out here originally for acting. And then, and then I moved into pursuing music, singing and songwriting. And, um, I would, you know, go home to, or home like upstate New York to see family at least twice a year and to see all of them to spend time with all of them and then um when God called me to this ministry I to this calling I would have loved to go home at least one year to like spend quality time with all of them but God was speaking to me right now in this season my work is priority my work, his work is priority. I sacrificed going home for Christmas for all of those years for, um, I don't know how many years, just basically whatever, I, whenever I started Fivefold Church, I never went home for Christmas since that because God wanted me there for the Christmas Eve service. Um, even when there was just like five of us or even when we had to do it online uh, one time streaming it. Um, I, I never went home since when was it? 2000, like Christmas, 2017. So I think just in Christmas, 2016, was my last time for Christmas at home. And that was like one of the most special times for me was having Christmas at home with my family and Christmas Eve service, singing hymns with my parents. And I had to sacrifice that God asked me to. And, um, I now live in a nice apartment I live in a nice apartment now, but I didn't live in such a nice apartment um, until 
2021, uh, fall 2021. Um, because financially I, 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 I didn't have hard, like any money, hardly any money. Um, it was just my parents helping me. So I was living like bare minimum because I didn't want to, and they couldn't, <laughs> I mean, I didn't want to ask them too much. I just asking them for the bare minimum. Um, and so, I mean, that includes just like, even if I'm getting a meal somewhere, it's like, I'm only getting water. I'm not, I'm just getting like, I'm like looking at the prices of the menu. Like that was the life I was living for the first, um, like three and a half years of the ministry of, of having the church. Um, so my Christmas was spent, um, I would go over to Chantal's place and she had a little nicer place than I did. And, um, at the time, but where I was uh, oh, and her parents, her parents' place was nice. So where I was, um, though, I would spend part of my Christmas in my apartment that wasn't so nice. I mean, it wasn't like horrible, but um, it wasn't in the greatest area of town just because of affordability reasons. And um, it was just a really basic two bedroom, just not very nice. Um, I mean, it was fine, you know, but <laughs> it got the job done. But my point is, is like, I couldn't spend Christmas in like my nice, the nice home with my family. You know, that was a sacrifice God was asking me to make. Um, and so my niece is graduating um, high school uh, this June. And I just booked flights um, last night to go to upstate New York to be there for her graduation. I won't miss any Sunday. It's just like going to be during the week, the days during the week. Um and this is going to be my first time going home. I mean, going to upstate New York. This is my home now in LA, but my my family's home, my parents' home. It's going to be my first time since 2021. I went home January, right like the week after the video went viral, which led to revival breaking out. So two months before the first demon was cast out. I surprised my mom. I wasn't there for Christmas, but I came like in January after. And, but I still didn't miss a Sunday. Just came home for a few days. That was the last time I was there. That was the last time. I, so my my nephews like have low voices now. It's so crazy. Like they're teen, they're uh, they're like t teen, all teenagers now. And <laughs> last time I saw them, they were not that way. So um, yeah, I mean that's a sacrifice God asked me to make. So. I just give that example of um, put put Jesus first and everything else will fall into place. It's going to also depend, like, if you have family members that aren't equally yoked, then that's going to mean that God's not wanting you to spend usually as much, like, time because that's not going to be iron sharpening iron and helping to feel your fire. And it's probably going to be a distraction of where you're ending up not doing so many things fruitful for the kingdom. We need to minister to our family, but... It's usually not going to look like tremendous hours per day, like ministering to our family. Usually we'll be more useful for the kingdom, planting seeds, but sh being the brightest light in our own lives for them to look and see rather than spending all this time with them that we're not able to spend time doing the work of God or, um, you know, growing in the Lord and, and kindling our fire. Amen. So, and then also there's going to be also people who there might be family members who are completely against Jesus or maybe they're religious and they're completely against Jesus in his new wine, Jesus in this revival. And if they're adamantly against Jesus, like continually, like they just com continue to speak against Jesus, against his anointing, against his anointed servants, um, that's going to be dangerous for your spiritual health. I mean, that's going to be it's the opposite of fueling into fan your the the fire that's in within you. It's going to really be like dampening unnecessarily upon you, um, upon your spirit, and 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 an open door just for the enemy's words to be speaking to you so much. So Jesus said, "I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring division, where there will be a sword between." Uh, I mean. Uh, uh, parents and children will be against each other. And really the meaning of that is, is that in some cases there will be some parents who do not accept Jesus and there will be some children who do accept Jesus. And so there's going to be a clashing there because of the parents' free will decision. 
And so um, the meaning of bringing division is like sometimes there needs to be boundaries set in place for your spiritual health and protection and you standing up for Jesus and you being unashamed for Jesus, you standing up for your faith and standing strong. So it's going to look like a, ho a whole different thing. Sometimes it can be complete huge boundaries put in place like in these situations and other areas it can be like a family member is kind of lukewarm so they're not um it, it's not wise to spend like too much time with them that it's 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 not helping you grow amen hallelujah just depending but then there can be a family member who is very spiritual equally yoked and you can spend more time with them. Oh yeah. And I just wanted to add, um, so I haven't gone home since, or to upstate New York since 2021, January. <laughs> and it's not like there was going to be a problem, like me leaving for a few days. I could have done that, but like my parents were able to come meet me at the revival events. And so it was just the Holy Spirit's wisdom of like, I just want you to stay focused right now, um, especially when I was traveling all around the world every single week. But even in the times where I wasn't traveling all around the week, it just wasn't the leading of the Holy Spirit. Like it just wasn't going to be fruitful for the kingdom and um, and me to go home before God's timing now of of going, if that makes sense. So to be sensitive to the, to the Holy Spirit versus cultural norms, like that's that's crazy that like I'm traveling the whole world yet I haven't been to even like see my grandma and my family that I love. My grandma's in her late eighties, you know, I haven't seen them since for, for four and a half or since 2021 January. It's like, it doesn't, it's not like culturally making sense. You know what I mean? But it's the leading of the Holy spirit. So make sure you're not like feeling guilty or feeling pressured by society and culture, you have to do what the Holy Spirit is leading. Amen. And I make phone calls. I call them at times, you know. Is reporting an issue with the manager at work where I have to present evidence and talk about what he did? Is it planting bad seeds, like talking against someone? Um, so when it comes to like legal matters or like if there's, wrong things that have occurred in business or even like even like your personal life if someone is harassing you if someone is you know hurting your safety harming your safety something like that let's say right or bringing abuse in some way um we have to use wisdom and we we have the, the people have free will so we can't just say, God, stop this person from doing this because people have free will. People can, people can choose to be used by the enemy. You know, that's why we, we, we don't become acting like we live in heaven while we're in earth. We lock our doors. Does that mean we don't trust God? No, but it's not wise to say, I'm going to keep my door unlocked because I don't need it. Jesus is my protection. And what I do is I pray for, to God that no person is allowed to come in my house. And no, we lock our doors, right? <laughs> Same with like your children. You're not going to just like leave your children somewhere um, alone. Uh, you know, um, that's wisdom. So the same thing applies. Same principle of like locking your house doing this like physical thing um, of putting a lock on the house, on the door. The same thing applies to anything in life. Like if someone's threatening your safety, harming you, harassing you, doing illegal things to you, um, it's important to put up locks in the physical realm. Like maybe you need to report it to the police or something. Or um, maybe if it's something happening like at the job, like you're talking about and you've experienced like harm happening to you, the person should be stopped from harming other people that might be, you know, important. And so it's important for you to share just to be truthful. These things have happened to me like that. That's, um, that's very important. It's wisdom. It's like the action of putting the lock on the door instead of leaving it unlocked and saying, God will just fix the situation, you know? 
Um, and so you don't need to feel bad about like, it's not like you're talking bad about someone in certain situations like that. You're just sharing truth. Um, that's important to share truth. There's a time that it's very important to share truth. So the speaking bad about people that should, what, when you shouldn't speak bad about people is like, so in that situation, you shouldn't go live and you shouldn't be like gossiping everywhere because you are mad about what that person did and you want to vent about it and you want other people to think badly about them and speak badly about them. That's what you shouldn't do. <laughs> That's what you should not do. Or if someone, like I experience this all the time, like people doing harm, trying to do harm to me with like speaking words against me, making up things against me. Um I am, I, you know, they have free will and free speech. They have free will to like make up lies and everything. So, um, unless it was like harming me and they are because they're false lies and false evidence is like making me to go to court or like something like that, then I will go and speak. This is the truth. This is what happened, you know? But if it's a situation of just people speaking lies about me online or something, I'm not going to just like say they have free speech, but they are wrong. And da -da 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 -da. like, that's an area where God, it's a spiritual thing. It's like, they're, they're not affecting my physical, physical, um, they're not harming me physically or literally harassing me. They're just choosing to um, use their free will and do speak bad things. You know, that's an area where I need to let God defend me and protect me and just stay focused and not be distracted by it and let the fruit speak for themselves. So if someone's speaking untrue things, I'll let, let them and I just do my job of doing the work of God and letting the fruit speak and people make their own decisions. That's what that's when it's it's inappropriate to speak badly against someone. Um, there can other there can be other circumstances too, like maybe if this person spoke this huge lie and like so many people are like believing it that it's causing this huge like disturbance. I'm talking about maybe like for a minister, then you can set the record straight. But like for me, the majority of false accusations that are spoken against me and lies that are speaking against me sure there's a large number that believe them but i can see spiritually that for the most part it's because they're choosing to it's because many are like it's like sheeps versus goats or like the wheat from the tares it's like people have pride so they don't want to see the truth they don't allow god to show them the truth to see the fruits and that's a free will matter. So like normally that's what's taking place. So that's why I don't try to like defend myself and shut the record straight because I know that it's it's the people that are believing these things are the ones that want to and have free will to and their eyes won't open no matter what I say. You know, that's normally why. But then if there was other, I've had it happen in the past where God did want me to like set the record straight and speak about it like um, to, to clarify things, then it's time, it's okay, but you're still not speaking bad against someone. You can say, you know, this person spoke something that wasn't true, but you speak it with um, without maliciousness, like without um, hate or trying to like speak against them, but just sharing truth. I remember you saying sometimes God will have will have you hold testimonies until a later time. How do we know he's leading us the same with certain testimonies. Um, I'm try I'm just trying to think. I know what you're talking about. I remember sharing something. So for me particularly, there's a couple things that have happened. Okay, so I see like, okay, so let's look at the time of Jesus when he was beginning his ministry and just his ministry on the earth. There was so much resistance there. The Pharisees were like strong, so strong that they, um, they were responsible from, for, for getting Jesus on the cross and crucifying him. Now God all allowed all of that. God allowed that. God could have stopped that, but he allowed that. He wanted this act. He needed the sacrifice to happen. But then 
look at us now. Look at us. I mean, even more recently than now, not not just thousands of years later, but even in the time of the apostles, 3,000 coming to Jesus in one day when there wasn't like hardly any believers before and all of a sudden 3,000 in one day, like that's so supernatural. It's just such a victory. So like you, you find Jesus facing this incredible resistance and that, but it was temporary. It was temporary. And so like Christianity and Jesus is accepted by it's like the biggest religion in the whole world or belief. I don't, we don't like to call it religion, but biggest belief. What a victory. Like, but look at the difference between that and like the time of Jesus with the Pharisees and saying that he was of the devil using demonic powers and people believing it so much that they took him to the cross. There was different seasons. There was different seasons. So um, I know like for this revival and for my ministry, and for my life, that I'm living in constant victory with Jesus. We are living in constant victory with Jesus. But it's 1% of the victory um, that we're going to see. Just like Jesus, you know, on the cross. People were saved that day when he, when he was crucified. And resurrected, but how many more have been saved since that day? It was like the, the victory has just like grown, you know? So um I yeah, I have a lot of testimonies of like how Pharisees have done things to me that I don't share yet. And some of it's with wisdom, some of it's like literally to not give these ideas to other Pharisees. <laughs> like they might be like, oh that worked it, not that it worked but like oh like that's that's a way to try to stop the work of god like there's certain testimonies that i have that i don't share with wisdom like that because of the season that we're currently in that i'm currently in but i know there will come a time where i can like share details and it doesn't matter if people get these ideas these evil ideas like oh like that's a great idea to try to stop the work of God um, to try to stop this ministry I'm gonna try that now you know it doesn't matter like they can, they can try all they want but they can't touch they really can't touch what God can do so you have to walk I have to walk in that wisdom of um like the devil is so defeated but he's gonna be even more defeated and he knows that and it's like he's he's so antsy He's so antsy and he, he know it's like he tries, it's like the devil threw all his punches so hard when Jesus was on this earth, you know, it's like, it's kind of like, it's kind of like that, like before it's like, there comes that time where Joseph was lifted out of the prison and he was placed in that position of, of being the highest position in all of the land, um, second highest position in all of the land. And like, so the devil knew that day was coming. So he was like trying his hardest in the prison, like to just like throwing punches. You know what I mean? So you have to know the season of where like the devil's kind of trying to throw more punches type thing and try not to hurt your, like give the devil so much opportunity. That's what I mean. So I would say in, in terms of like, is it the right time to share your testimony yet? I would say like, for the most part, it's having to do with what I just shared. It's having to do with maybe uh, with ministries, with with ministers because of the the um, the Pharisees. But for most people that like aren't ministers, um, I would say for the most part, share everything. For the most part, um, but just be truthful because every testimony that you have, like every miracle that God's done, that's ripe fruit. That's ripe fruit. Now, let's say you, um, let's say like, let's say that you battled with schizophrenia or some sort of mental problem and you've seen the thoughts diminish quite a bit. Um, some people might think I'm going to wait till they're gone completely to testify, but that's not wise. That's a major miracle that God's done if the thoughts have diminished what you shouldn't do is like think that you're making God proud or it's more faith to speak what's not true. Well, maybe in the spiritual realm, it's true you're completely healed. 
but you should you still should be truthful about the physical manifestations that you're experiencing uh, to make the the testimony even more powerful when the physical manifestations are completely true. Like, so let's say, I mean, completely, completely there. So the proper way to do it is I used to battle with all of these demonic voices and then I went to where the anointing was uh, and now the thoughts diminished a lot and maybe share in detail. Like, for example, it used to be like this in the morning, in the middle day, in the night. And now it's just been at the nighttime, but I know that I'm healed completely. And I'm just like, I'm overjoyed by this incredible miracle. Don't downplay it. You should really not downplay the testimony, even though it's not complete yet physically manifested. You need to be truthful that it's very important. Your delivery of your testimony is very important. You need to share like the extent that it's blessed you. And don't fake it at the same time. You know, don't fake it. When you share little miracles, you don't have to over exaggerate, be truthful because people can see truth and it makes it even more powerful when, when you're truthful the whole way that when God brings the, the full manifestation, you you can see in your face, like you're telling the truth and you're so overcome and blessed. Then if you're like acting and fake uh, leading up to it, you know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, th like, that's what I mean. Like, d you, for the most part, you're to share, you're just to share the truth. You're just to share the truth. That, you received a miracle, share the truth. <laughs> you received the partial miracle, share the truth and share it with hope and life. Like speak, declare like, but I know that it's done in the spiritual realm and I can't wait to see it manifest physically. And I know it's going to come from testifying the, the more of the physical manifestation. That's why it's so important to not hold back, to not wait. Oh, I'm going to wait until... Um, 100% I'm seeing it manifest physically because it's prob from in most cases it's your key to see the full manifestation is to testify the partial miracle it, it they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony the devil is so mad that you received this miracle this partial miracle halfway miracle or something and so he wants to try to steal that so he's going to come with attacks usually so you overcome him by testifying amen and also like the, the fruits, the fruits are what brings uh, victory over the devil and makes God's revival unstoppable uh, and to grow and grow and grow and to be undeniable is what, is what shows Jesus. Like the fruits are what reveals Jesus. Like this is Jesus. Come and receive Jesus. It's what reveals the truth is the fruits. So we need to see all the fruits. You have a fruit, don't hold it back. You holding it back is leading to less people seeing the truth, seeing the light, seeing that this is Jesus and coming and receiving. So it direct it directly translates to those whose eyes are shut opening, those who have been hounded by Pharisees lies and been confused to them coming into clarity and their eyes opening up. Your fruits, no matter how big or small, directly translated to that. So it's, it's very crucial. It's like the most important job you have, especially in this season right now, um, is to, to, share, to show the fruits, to display the fruits of Jesus, to display the fruits of his power, his anointing, his revival, the ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. I declare that you would grow in wisdom from now, that this word you received, I see right now that, there's some words released today that's bringing salvation for many people, like salvation in terms of being in God's will. I see some of these questions that were answered today specifically, like one I'm thinking of that I see some people tiptoeing around God's will in the, in the area of, of some of the things I answered. And it's like an open door for the enemy to be tiptoeing around God's will in this area. And I see that if you take these, as you take these words to heart, take them as the word of God, take them as serious. I see God just pulling you into his will like you've never been and safety, safety upon your life, protection upon your life and growth upon growth that you couldn't imagine and anointing pouring in your life like never before. So I speak this word to 
to stay in your heart and revelation to come more. Like for some of you that you just hear this word, but you don't like really understand it fully. You don't quite like grasp it or just, you just don't get it completely. I declare grace upon you for the eyes of your understanding to open up for this spiritual revelation to increase in you upon these words I've spoken in Jesus name. May you increase in the fire of the Lord. May you increase in joy. May you increase in his peace. May you increase in abundance. May you increase in fruitfulness. May more fruits come from your life. May you abound in good works and good fruits. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.